this and then additional information. It's like a reasonable draft. It's a linear inbox thinking. <clears throat> See if we have stragglers. We'll get started. So, how are we all connected? Are we doing all network? I think so. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks for checking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> to go. Uh, we have quite a bit to cover today, so I'm just going to jump on in and introduce our topic. Today we are going to conquer the universe, and really we're talking about the, uh, the universe of universal design and implementing universal design concepts into your classroom, into your curriculum. And the idea that this workshop is, what we're trying to do is accomplish a model of what this might look like for you in your classroom as well. So you'll see us um, call out certain goals, or if you take a look at the handouts that we've given you, all of these things are supposed to be examples of ways that you can do this and what it might look like in an actual setting. Now, are we perfect at it? Absolutely not, but we're trying. Um, as is the idea of this is to take steps into embracing new ideas and evaluating your existing curriculum and things of that nature. So. With that said, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Christine Rochow. I'm the Instructional Assistant Specialist. I work with academic technology and faculty at Central Oregon Community College. So we are uh, the local crowd, as it were. And I will let my colleagues introduce themselves as well. Um, my name is Michael Murphy. I'm the Director for eLearning and Academic Technology here at COCC. And I work with all three of these people. And that one too. <laughs> I'm Yasko Jackson. I'm the Instructional Design Specialist. Uh, and I'm Jamie Ruji. I am the Coordinator for Services for Students with Disabilities at CCC. Yeah, so I'm going to let Jamie talk a little bit about why and how disability services is um, a group that we partner with quite a lot. So if you'd like to click her, <coughs> great. Or if you want me to click for you, I can do that. Sure. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, so as Christine said, yeah, um, I'm from Disability Services. So uh, the question is, is what is my department doing here? Um, why am I at this conference presenting? Um, how am I connected with, with these folks? So my department at COCC is a group of three people. So one of them is here in this room. So the two of us and one other person. Uh, and we service for about 600 students a year. Uh, and that number is actually increasing every term. And a lot of that is learning-based disabilities, reading, writing, um, attention, mental health disabilities, things like that. Um, and so with the three of us in such a small department, uh, my budget is pretty much um, non-existent. And my technology budget is pretty much zero. Um, so, you know, trying to be creative, coming up with accommodations to, to work with students is getting very challenging um, with, a, with a zero budget and zero technology. Um, so then I learned about this amazing department called e-learning and this buzzword called academic technology. And I thought, what is that stuff? And I started learning more about um, academic technology support that, that they teach and provide. And then I started connecting the dots and hearing what this academic technology does and then when I meet with a student, I hear about all these barriers they have to learning, and I started piecing that together and going, wow, if instructors use this academic technology in the classroom, this student wouldn't actually have that barrier anymore to learning and would, would probably have a bigger chance of success. Uh, because right now, our departments work really uh, reactively. 
Um, I'm sure a lot of you folks uh, love when disability services comes knocking on your door, all, all you faculty, and say, you know, heads up, we need to get some accommodations going. Uh, sometimes it's kind of a scramble because we have to, we have to provide those on a timely basis. Um, sometimes the instructor's not used to the accommodations. They don't, they're not familiar with technology. Uh, there's lots of delays, and that will really impact the student. And so in learning about e-learning and all this academic technology, uh, and, and talking with them a lot, we thought, man, what if we really could combine forces and start to promote this stuff a little bit more in the front end? That way, we can teach faculty how to be really proactive with their curriculum um, and using things like academic technology because in the form of, in the vehicle of universal design for learning. Because by, by using this universal design format, you're really, you're really targeting all these individual needs without having to create all this individual work. If you kind of create a, a broader curriculum, um, you're really going to enhance the, the chances of success for each individual student, whether they have barriers and come from my department or not. So uh, we, we started combining forces and, and have um, come up with um, this presentation as, as one of those formats. So, um, so as our graphic shows here, this is just kind of our intro to it. Um, I'm so used to explaining graphics when I go to disability conferences. So um, if everyone can't see that, basically the teacher's in the head of the class and says, for a fair assessment, everybody has to do the same thing, climb the tree. And between a monkey, an elephant, a fish, you know, one person's going to succeed there and everyone else is, is going to fail. So, um, And I've already learned that I should have copyrighted that and I didn't. I don't, I don't even remember where that source came from, so um, I need to go back and do that. Um, and so starting uh, with the concept of, of universal design for learning, what we're looking at is an equitable experience, not necessarily equal. We're not looking at giving everyone the exact same thing, just like that graphic showed. We, we really don't want to provide just one test for, for every student. We're trying to look at the individual learning needs. So uh, equality, an equal experience means everyone gets the same thing. That's what that left side shows with everyone has the same size box but uh, an equitable experience where everyone gets kind of what more of what they need. Um, there's different size boxes, some have no boxes. Um, that's really what the concept of, of universal design is, is kind of individualizing um, that. And we're hoping we can show you some ways that you can start to um, and learn about this and incorporate it in your curriculum. So um, now I will turn it over to Michael. So, um, you know, when you're talking about modeling, I was so pleased to see this when we were went, going to all the other sessions. All the other sessions, I guess, because it's a lot of teachers do, because this is awesome. They give you the goals for their session. And, and one of the things that UDL really wants to do is make sure you're clear about what you're trying to get across to students or whoever your audience is at that time. And one of the ways to add clarity to do that is give them your goals. And these are our four goals for today. We want to provide you with a basic understanding of UDL. I'm sure that most of you have a really good basic understanding about universal design for learning, but we'll, you know, reacquaint you with that. Um, we'll talk about the components of UDL-based instruction, what that means. Uh, we'll introduce a few new ideas for assessing your own curriculum according to UDL principles that may be useful to you and as you're thinking about um, adding things into your course, and we'll explore different resources for UDL in practice. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I know I would have screwed that up. Um, okay, what is universal design for learning? Well, UDL is a set of principles for curriculum development that gives an equitable, uh, equitable experience for all learners. I don't know if you know a little bit about the history of this, but this came about in about 1984 with a group called CAS, which is the Center for Applied um, Special Technology. And it came about from a bunch of uh, parents that had some students with not just only physical, but with learning disabilities. But the cool thing about it is a lot of these parents that started coming up with these ideas were architects. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of them were architects. And they had been doing some design regarding universal design for physical space. And so if we look about universal design, the way it used to look, it talked about only physical presence and physical space and what they were doing about that. They, so people were actually working back in the 80s 
which was a big time when we started really talking about, okay, we need to make space accessible for people with physical disabilities. Well, they started looking at designs for buildings being becoming more proactive, you know, like having doors opening, having slopes for uh, people in wheelchairs, ability to get up into the buildings. But these parents started thinking about, well, what research is out there for learn people with learning disabilities? How do we improve instructional environments? How do we create um, spaces that are getting rid of those learning barriers for students? And how do we proactively design that instead of reactively designing that? Um, so they came up with this idea through research about thinking about the uh, neural network patterns and how students actually learn. So the, the how, the what, and the, ha the how, the what, and the why of learning. Um, and if you can see the different areas of the brain that these potentially work on is that how we are interested, what motivates us, what challenges of us, the affective learning, the stimulus, how we motivate students, how we get them interested, the recognition, the what of learning, how we gather facts, how we uh, categorize things, how we, what we see, hear, touch, feel, the sensations, uh, how we present information to students. You know, we probably want to think of these things as, um, do we always present the same information in the same way to students? You know, and is that the most in, uh, in, impactful way? Um, the, if we think about the first one, the what of learning, the uh, representation, what are ways or ways that we can go about and how do we target different learning styles for students? How does that look? How does that look to students? How do we do that? One of the ways is perhaps clarity in the way we introduce things, the method of, of delivery of a particular piece of information. You don't necessarily want to make everything popcorn and make everything absolutely different, but you might want to think of not just methods of delivery, but methods that students deliver stuff back to you. Does it always have to be in a written format? Can a person you know, maybe send something to you in an auditory format, or maybe send something to you in a visual format. You know, you might want to change up the abilities of, uh, or the ways that you provide to students to get information back to you. Um, the next thing is engagement, the, the why of the learning. How do you stimulate interest in something? How do you motivate them, students online? You know, you might want to think about that too. What, um, how you're delivering that information again. How do you're making optimizing choice. Do you give students an opportunity? Let's say if you want them to write about something or about theorists, I'm thinking about that right now, but if you're having students giving them choices, not just say, you have to write a 13-page paper on Dewey, right? That might really bore them to tears, right? You might want to give them lots and lots of choices. You might also think about how you connect lessons to learning objectives and heighten the relevance of that. One of the things I had a professor do when the very first time I saw a professor do this, I was like, finally. They connected all of their learning objectives with every single lesson. So whatever learning objectives were set in their course, they provided that learning objective in every single course, in every single, not every single course, in every single lesson, so they knew, the student knew exactly why they were doing it. Um, they also did a lot of project and problem-based learning. Rather than just every single drive lesson, you know, read this, take a test, read this, take a test. They, as students gain knowledge about the um, topic they were learning, they were actually asked to go out and apply that in a real life setting. So that even though it was online, it provided some relevance to real life situations. Expression, strategic ne networks, the how of learning, differentiated instruction. How many people know about differentiated instruction here? Kind of aware of that? Okay. You know, how sometimes people used to do that. I remember people did that. Paper. Right? You know. Differentiated instruction means a whole lot more than just giving them a study paper. Right? You might want to really, really think about how you can make that relevant for a student. And how do we do it online? We might think about collaborative work. We might think about 
time. They might need to self-assess what they know about this topic and might give us a clue how much they know about this before we have them move forward with this. Reflective information, journaling. Journaling is a great way to get to know what students know about something or learn about what they think about a particular topic. Multimodal assessment is certainly relevant as well. So these are things you might want to think about as you provide students opportunities and ways to assess and ways to formatively assess people. Okay, so thank you. That was a wonderful explanation of the three brain networks and the way they work together. Now I'm going to introduce to you some ways that we might think this is a more approachable way to attempt this in your classroom because I am not a neuroscientist. Um, I read those slides and had to really kind of noodle on it for a minute about what that might actually look like. So if you're approaching this, what we recommend first is to choose one. Just start with one activity, one lesson. If we're ambitious, maybe one module, and you're going to scale up one thing at a time. So pick one activity, something that you're comfortable and familiar with, curriculum that you've taught before, something that you can speak to about your class without having to refer back to your own notes because you're trying something new too um, and you're asking them to do something new. So the more confidence you have in your subject, the more confidence your students are going to have um, when they start compiling their activities and learning materials and things of that nature. And then we're going to identify which principle the lesson addresses. So what are we focusing? Are you, are you going to really dig into different ways of representation? How are you, are, are you going to change the way you deliver that material? Or are you going to ask the students to deliver something back to you in a different way? Are you going to have them express their learning to you in a new format? Or are you trying something new out in terms of engagement? Are you asking them to use a new tool? Are you asking them to engage in a classroom activity that's different? The next one is to Research ideas based on the resources given at the end of the presentation. I had to read that out loud, but we do have a packet of information for you. You should all have one that lists quite a few different resources that we've found. We're really lucky in 20, almost 20, to have a really rich, um, uh, a really rich set of resources online. People have really been digging into this topic, and there are tons of great ideas for activities. There's lots of stuff that discusses the theory out there on a level, again, that you don't have to be a neuroscientist to understand, but which you can engage with. So explore those activities in your packet. Um, brainstorm a little bit. Think about the way that that's going to work with your curriculum. And then compare your new changes with your course competencies. So you've tried it out in your classroom. How did it go? Did your students like it? Did you get a positive response from them? Did it absolutely flop? Because that can happen, and that's okay because it's a learning experience. You get to pick yourself up and say, all right, that didn't work so well, class, let's discuss. What did you get out of this? What did you get, didn't get out of this? What were the barriers that you found? How can I improve? That's a great question for like mid-course evaluation type things. So look at it, compare it to what you've done in the past. See what changed. And then uh, try it out again. Keep going, keep refining, keep tweaking. Um, don't be afraid to, uh, to completely scrap it and start over if you need to. The idea is that universal design is a cumulative experience. You're always going to be continually addressing and, um, the needs of your students and being flexible with the resources that you have at the time you have them. So here's our, again, our recommendation, just to recap, but to choose an activity, identify the lesson or principle that you want to focus on, uh, research ideas of ways you can do that, um, Compare those changes to what your previous curriculum was and then try it out and review. And our next uh, thing that we're going to do is we're actually going to do a little bit of an interactive activity. Um, and I'm trying something totally new myself in terms of engagement. So this is new. This is modeling. Again, um, I have never used Pull everywhere, but I have seen it in a bazillion places and I think it's kind of cool. So down there on the bottom of the screen, you can see if you text... Christine Roche, R-O-S-H, 842 to the number 223333. That'll give you into our poll everything room. You don't have to if you're not comfortable. I just want to give this as an option. But what we're going to do is we're going to explore three different scenarios where an instructor evaluates his classroom activities, and we're going to look at what principles those activities represent. So in scenario number one, our traditional format, if you will, is our Dr. Smith, who's a biology teacher. He awards his students points for participation 
where that participation is based on how much that student engages in in-classroom discussions. So if he's talking to his class, he's lecturing, he's asking students questions, do they raise their hand, do they engage, that's how they're earning their participation points. That's a very traditional model, um, and it works for some students, and it's not going to work as well for others. Um, the universal design tweak of that scenario is that he still awards points for participation, but he gives his students options for how this is measured. So students can participate. They can participate by speaking in class if that's something that they find themselves comfortable with. They can contribute to an online discussion board. They can contribute to a course wiki. Maybe they turn in a reflection after class based on what was discussed in class. So again, we're giving our students lots of different options. So here's where we see if this works. Do we think in scenario one that Dr. Smith is addressing expression, engagement, or representation? In theory, this should be responsive. <laughs> okay. A couple of engagements so or expression engagement, yeah? Filling it out a little bit. One more for engagement. This is cool, guys. Thanks for hanging with me on this one. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and move on for time's sake, but this is engagement. Dr. Smith is giving his students different ways to engage with the material. Um, a lot of these you'll find that the lines between expression, engagement, and representation can get a little blurry, and that's completely okay. In this situation, we were aiming for engagement just because it's the way that students are connecting with that material and connecting with the class. In our next scenario, in his biology class, the students who want to have notes on the weekly lecture have to write them while he's giving the lecture. They're writing them in class. They're that student who's in the front row that's just erratically writing, or the student in the back row who's like... So you have both, you know. So if they need notes, they either have to write them in class or they borrow them from another student, they have to get them from some external source. The universal design principle of this would be that he posts his lecture slides in a universally acceptable format, in the learning management system before class starts. It allows students to get those things in advance, to review them in advance. A little bit of that, I heard this term in another session about pre-training, which I thought was absolutely fantastic um, word for this concept of giving your students that little nudge before they actually dive into the material. Um, and he also records his lectures. He either records them at home and posts it with his uh, lecture slides, or perhaps he's at a school where they have resources available to capture in class sessions. So, let's see again. I'm going to have to advance this. Um, sorry, this is where my, my presentation falls apart with the presentation style. Oops. Do you see a next button? Because I do not. Oh, yeah. Right there. Oh, there we go. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Scenario number two. Representation, engagement, or expression. What do we think? Remember, he is he's, he's posting his... Um, lecture slides online, he's offering a recorded session of his course, he's giving his students a little bit of advance notice. <laughs> okay. It's like we're modeling, remember? So we're yeah. modeling when you try new stuff? <laughs> yeah, sometimes we have, um, okay, so in this case, maybe just raise your hand. Do we think it is uh, representation? Hey, big group there. Uh, engagement, expression. The ruling body says representation and there we go. It is indeed representation and he's representing uh, his material in multiple ways. 
Our last scenario is scenario number three, and this has to do with assessment. Dr. Smith usually gives them a gigantic 100-point final exam, uh, which is a large multiple-choice test. This is a fairly traditional model that we may see a lot of. The universal design idea, or something that he might want to try, is that he gives three options for his final assessment. Um, each graded on a shared rubric. This is key so that the students are all being assessed on their achievement or mastery of the same learning principles, but the way that they can, uh, I'm about to give it away, uh, share that back with him it might be a research paper, a recorded presentation. Maybe they set up their own little presentation that covers um, a set of objectives or um, uh, uh, outcomes for that particular assessment. Um, or they give a review of a local a visit to a local medical center. They, they go and they visit and they meet with someone, they talk about it, they write a reflection. And I'm not going to go into the poll everywhere because I think I probably don't have it working, but what do we think? Uh, by raise of hands, engagement, representation, or expression? Yay! <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, yes, indeed, this is expression. Again, we're giving the students the option to express their learning in a way that is um, comfortable to them. Remember, we're not looking at assessment as a punitive thing. Um, it's not about um, trying to make students fail. We want our students to succeed. And sometimes that means giving them options to stand up where they're best. Maybe they're really great, charismatic public speakers. So giving them the option to do a presentation where they discuss the material is going to really allow them to shine and show exactly how well they understand what they've been learning all term. Or maybe they're great reflective thinkers and they love to write and they need that extra time to reflect and where a paper might be more appropriate. Or maybe there's someone who connects really well with other people um, and a chance to have some interaction with another person is really going to allow them to engage and express most uh, effectively for them. So now that we've gone a little bit about um, how this might look in different classroom scenarios, I want you to turn to the person next to you and talk about one of these subjects. We're just going to give this two minutes or so, so really quickly. But which learning network does your activity or material address? If you have a particular assignment, maybe something that's coming up, I think we're getting close to midterms for several of us. Do you have something about your midterm that you could maybe tweak with universal design principles? Um, does that traditional method that you've been using or ones that you may have seen or even ones that you may have experienced as a student, how well do those align with universal design principles? And think about who in your classroom might benefit from something like that. So I'm going to put us on a timer. We'll get two minutes, and we will go for it. The poem is a great idea. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I threw it in my phone this morning, so I'm like, I'm going to have to turn on the phone. That's good, because you're saying, don't be afraid to try to say anything. That's why I was like, we're behind. Yeah, we are behind. That was perfect. I thought it was a great idea. And a great way to show another way of presenting information and sharing it. That's cool. We are doing it. I just love how you do it. Can you guys use it? I have to use it. The letter? J. 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 <laughs> you were the coach. I love this. I love this. I just love this. <laughs> I want to make we start this one more interjection from the talk we went to yesterday, the kiss talk, keep it simple, super simple. The Toby Tobin and the 
Sarah Brooks talking about those yeah. particular uh, references because I think people might want to get those references. Great books. It's a it's interesting. Okay, 10 seconds, and we're going to jump back in. I almost hate to cut you off because it sounds like there's some really great energetic conversation happening. Okay, 10, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and we're back. Okay. Thank you so much for contributing and sharing with your partners. I know for some of us that's a little out of the box, or maybe not out of the box, but uncomfortable. But thank you. And now I'm, we're going to let uh, my colleagues who are going to pick us back up. Yeah. So the so, big idea, and I'm glad you got an opportunity to share like that. But um, I don't know who of you went yesterday's session to the KISS session, the Keep It Super Simple. Um, one of those things, it was a great session, and they talked about a couple of uh, research pieces that I think you might be interested in. I want to share these again today. Uh, Thomas Tobin, he's an author of Reach Everyone, Teach Everyone. If you're interested in reading a great book about UDL, that's another one. Sarah Burke Statler, I don't know, for 2015, UD in Higher Education, From Principle to Practice. And I can give you those afterwards. We'll add that in here so you can have those as well. But the idea, the simple idea is you don't have to do everything at once. It's the elephant um, uh, and you don't have to eat an elephant all at once. It's one spoon at a time. And so the idea is plus one. If you can add just one thing to your course, just one element that's going to help 10 more students this term, then you can add one more element next time and then add 10 more students that might have issues and that might need some additional assistance. So the idea is just keep building on what you have. You don't have to do everything all at once. So what is that elephant in the room that Michael was just referencing? It is fear, a lot of fear base. So uh, remember, my role is uh, in disability services. So when I come knocking on the door to faculty, you know, there's a lot of fear, concern, um, a lot of reactivity, trying to get accommodations settled. So this is really my opportunity with faculty to start saying, you know, what might make it uh, a lot easier on you in the future is if you can think about how you can incorporate some universal design for learning um, curriculum uh, that then will reduce the need for all of these types of accommodations, you know, last minute and make things, you know, pretty, pretty um, hard on you. So that's when I start hearing all these fears and concerns. Well, you know, if I give students different things to do, how do I, how do I know they're really going to learn the material and um, how am I going to make sure students aren't cheating or, you know, just tons of fears and concerns. And Rightly so. You've had this curriculum for a long time. It's worked. We're just asking you to start thinking about it a little differently uh, for a wider variety uh, in your audience. So um, some of the questions are, are what we're going to address is look at that thinking and then some, some kind of self-coaching questions that you can use to, to uh, address in your own material. Um, and that packet that you have, I think there is a sheet on there that provides some extra self-coaching questions that you can look at um, as you get um, experience in, in looking at your curriculum. So one thing I hear about a lot is, well, uh, I have to call on my students in class because if I don't, I won't know they're engaged. So you got to think about, well, what is your evidence for that? How do you know students aren't engaged? Um, you know, we, you don't really know how students are sitting there and what they're thinking about and what they're learning. So what's another way you can assess engagement? Well, can you have students maybe have a note card in class and as they, they think of stuff, can they write down the thoughts that they want to share and can they turn that in at the end of class? Because um, if you're just calling on people in class, you're really only prioritizing the, the fast-paced processors. You're kind of missing out on the students who have slower processing and that's not really giving them an opportunity to participate. So um, another example is, well, if I offer multiple options to students, a paper, a presentation, a test, um, how will I know that it's fair if everyone's doing different things? Well, you need to look at your true objectives. What are the true objectives of the course versus kind of the arbitrary skills that you think are just good for a college student to learn? Um, so, to, so a good way to help with that is if you can create maybe a few different rubrics, they should be pretty similar because they have the same objectives, but the style is just going to be a little different, and that's okay. Um, so another example I hear is, well, um, 
you know, they're, I'm trying to get them ready for the real world, and so I, I need to do it this way because they, you know, they're going to be a, a, an adult in the, in the workforce someday. Well, this isn't the workforce. This is the learning environment, and we have no idea what type of job the student's going to be in. We have no idea what type of boss they're going to have. We have no idea how strict or lenient that boss is going to be for the student. Um, so we just want to rem remember to bring it back to uh, the competencies because... The true competencies are really what you're addressing. The other stuff is stuff that you probably think is good. Like, I think it's good for students to develop some public speaking skills. Great, but that's not what really you're addressing if you're teaching biology or something like that. So you just have to really learn to separate those two, two things about um, your course. And remember, um, you know, allowing students that choice in universal design for learning is actually really good critical thinking skills. Students have to self-assess their own um, skills. Are they good at presenting or are they better at taking tests? They have to make those decisions about themselves. That's really important to develop as an individual. So um, that's also what I talk with instructors about. So again, these are just some of the sample questions that I bring to faculty and say, these are some of the things I just want you to think about. Um, are your objectives measurable? Which ones are those broad goals that I was talking about? And which ones are really the specific learning objectives? So for your test taking, for students who need extended time, I, I do have faculty that, that fight me on that um, and on the um, online learning environment. And I say, well, why does your test need a time limit, um, even if it's just an extra 30 minutes? Are you testing for how fast they can um, you know, say your information, or are you really testing on the learning of the information? Um, and you'd be surprised. There's still faculty that think it, it really comes down to how fast they can do it. Uh, so my example for that for faculty is, is you know, really a timely assessment really is CPR. That assessment is based on time. You have to perform in a certain time frame or the person will die. So yes, that is the true objective is time. Um, taking a test on, you know, biology terms. No, it's not life or death. That's not really the true objective. It's really if they understand and learn the information. Um, and we're not talking about endless amount of time on your test. We're just talking about, um, you know, a, a reasonable amount of time, but just not restricting that time frame so much as, as maybe they used to. Um, and again, thinking about ways your students can participate. Um, do, you know, instead of just calling on students quickly or the fastest learner can raise their hand, you know, think about other ways that students can, can turn in um, their thinking throughout the class time. And, and those um, different types of rubrics that we talked about. So remember, you're teaching, you want to address, address the mastery of the learning outcomes, but the method, which I highlight down there, the method should be able to be done in multiple ways uh, if you're looking at universal design for learning. So how they reach those objectives is really what can be flexible. Um, okay. So... Um, how, like Michael just said, how do we do that? It's a process. Uh, it happens with one document, one activity, one test, just a little bit at a time. This is the other thing that we emphasize for faculty. It's like we are not asking you to start from scratch. You do not have to redesign your entire curriculum. Um, just try one thing, one thing a little differently. Where can you provide a little bit more flexibility uh, in your engagement, in um, the assessment, um, anything like that? So. Is it? That's me. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so the last part of our discussion today is I want to talk to you about um, what things you might have in your toolkit. So if you'll pardon the continual beating of this metaphor about eating an elephant, um, what's in your toolkit, right? What's in your utility drawer? So one of the things that Jamie talked about at the very beginning of this was how and why our department, e-learning and academic technology, started working so closely with disability services. And it was because a lot of the tools and resources that we have in our department um, offered the kind of flexibility and accommodations that her students were asking for. And then, again, as we started working more closely together, all that we, we were uncovering all the different ways that we can be proactive about this rather than reactive. And um, if we if we step forward with this idea of universal design, you're creating that space where students can be elevated without having to necessarily ask. And academic technology is one of those leaders that we can really uh, lean on in order to do that. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about things that we have at our institution. I know that many of these things are probably familiar to you in some way, or you have something that's very similar at your own institution, so kind of keep thinking about what tools you have and the ways that you might be able to use them. 
Um, for us, one of the things that we really love is Blackboard Ally. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. We have Read Speaker, we use Kaltura, Capture Space, Zoom, and we're really fortunate in Oregon to be part of a consortium that allows us to um, afford some of these tools because we definitely wouldn't be able to on our own. Um, but one thing that our e-learning department, um, and by our e-learning department, I mean Michael Yasko and myself, <laughs> we do is we put these up on our website. Um, and most likely, your institution has done that as well. Whoever is in your e-learning department, whether you know maybe that's you, or maybe you work with them closely, uh, get in touch with them, talk to them, explore their websites. They probably put a lot of time into them. They'd love it if you went and poked around about what exactly we have available to you. Um, so I want to talk to you about three of the big ones for us. The first one is Blackboard Ally. Chemeketa gave, uh, they may be giving it right now, or maybe they just did give a presentation about their implementation of Ally. Um, they went about it in a very structured way, which I admire and did not do at all. I just threw it out there at my faculty and said, look at it, <laughs> use it, <laughs> um, and then gave several talks about it. But anyway, uh, what Ally is, this is an integrated tool to raise awareness about um, accessible course design and particularly accessible documents and materials that you upload into your course. So if you've never seen it, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, is um, Ally lays over your LMS, and it is LMS agnostic, even though it is technically owned by Blackboard, but it overlays your material and says, hey, big red gauge, this document is not accessible at all. Your students don't see that. It's not punitive, but it's really putting in that principle of um, out of sight, out of mind. Sometimes we can forget that these things need to be looked at or reviewed or addressed. It's just saying, hey, I'm here. Maybe click on me and learn something. And that's exactly what you can do with Ally. You can click on it, and it tells you why the thing was graded the way it was graded or gauged, if you will, um, what you can do about it, why it's important. And then it guides you through the process of making that particular item more accessible. Sometimes that requires going into the original artifact and re-uploading. Sometimes it can be done within the LMS itself, which is super handy, especially for images. So if you have the opportunity to explore something like this, highly recommend. Our faculty have found that really useful. They also have found it um, really motivating, sometimes infuriating. <laughs> I get faculty that call me and say, I have been tinkering with this document for two days and it's still orange. I said, well, first of all, call me like if you're stuck after 10 minutes, right? Um, but also, let's look at that. Let's explore. What's the thing that we can both learn about why this is still getting flagged and is it necessary? Um, and it just gives us an opportunity to have that conversation. Another thing that we use a lot is ReadSpeaker. This is another integrated tool. Um, it works within our LMS. It can be applied in lots of other different learning tools as well. But it is a live text-to-speech uh, tool. It also has a lot of reading comprehension tools. So it's great for students who have struggles reading on a screen. I know sometimes my eyes, after a while, they're just, you know, can't read that small, it's blurry anymore. So it's got rules and things like that. Uh, rules meaning like guides. So it's super cool, there's translation services, students can take notes on it, they can highlight it, they can listen to it in a different language. We have ReadSpeaker enabled for Spanish at our institution, which we find so helpful. Um, we love it. This is also for our disability services folks. This allows us to offer, um, what would you call Test it? in the auditory format. Um, Thank you. I actually, uh, I, I think this has actually been extremely beneficial, one of the most beneficial ones coming from uh, my perspective, because I get faculty who call me and say, what is this Read Speaker thing? I have students coming up to me saying, hey, I need your document uploaded to Blackboard because I need to use Read Speaker. Hey, you don't have it Read Speaker formatted, and they're going, what is this thing? Um, and I explain to them, you know, it's not just for, uh, you know, old-fashioned disabilities, but a lot of students who need uh, to listen to something while they're, they're reading it is really engaging that sense for them. And it just takes a quick upload, and it's pretty much read speaker ready. So it, it's really it's been a game changer, I think, for a lot of our, mm -hmm. our students. Huge time saver. And again, with universal design, we see this, just like Jamie said, it's not necessarily the students with the really visible or um, disabilities where they have to be proactive and vocal about their accommodations, but it hits those students who maybe don't even know that they have a need, or maybe they just find it helpful. Another thing that ReadSpeaker does is it allows students to download things in different formats, so they can download an MP3 of a document. It's a little synthetic, it's a little bit of a Siri voice, but it still enables them to listen to it. 
maybe when they're commuting from Redmond to our Bend campus or something of that nature. Another, oh, yep, yeah, that's what it looks like. <laughs> I forgot that slide was there. So you kind of see it highlights as it talks. Um, and then there's a whole suite of integrated tools that go with it. So it's all right there. Another nice thing about this is that faculty don't have to ask for this to be put in their course. It's just part of the LMS. It's just there. Um, the other one that we use a lot is Kaltura Media and Capture Space. Um, another very similar tool would be Panopto. Uh, allows for lecture capture, allows for closed captioning. It's kind of two different tools. Kaltura Media is the host and server, and Capture Space is the utility that you can use to do video uh, lectures. So if you're looking at different ways of engaging your students, or if you want them to engage with you, it's also, it goes both ways. Students can upload things to Kaltura Media. Um, so it makes it very, you know, they don't have to fuss with creating a YouTube account or anything if they want to host video. You don't have to go through the uh, loading it into the LMS, which is not really designed for that. Um, so it allows them to interact with media. They have media tools that are there, that's free, it's integrated. And then for our faculty, beyond creating their own lectures, if they have raw video that they've sourced from somewhere else or that they created a couple of years ago, they can upload it through Kaltura Media, and it takes me 10 seconds to go into the server and check that box that sends it off to be captioned. And that is a huge thing for us. Um, making sure that all of our media is closed captioned has been um, a, a true test of that eating an element, elephant statement because it is a mountain of work to do. And if you, we've been creating media for 20 years, and all of a sudden we're realizing that we really do have to address that accommodation. Um, and those 508 requirements. The ability to partner with a service that allows for captioning, and particularly one that is integrated with a video service like Panopto or Kaltura. Um, I think Canvas's integrated one maybe does this as well, where it just, it's automated. So it takes the onus of closed captioning and worrying about that element of accessibility off of the faculty member, which makes them much more likely to actually try and explore creating media artifacts. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to caption a 40-minute video by hand. I might say, maybe we shouldn't be making 40-minute videos to start with, but <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they just allows, it just it mm -hmm. embraces your creativity. So we find that that is a real, um, a real boon for our group as well. Um, and again, just kind of what it looks like. You can capture your screen, you can capture a webcam, you can just record audio, and then it uploads directly into the LMS. Um, it's, it's great, and when it works seamlessly, it, it's really beautiful. So those are some of the tools that we have in our toolbox. And I want to close and wrap up this session by giving you a couple of homework items that relate to that. Um, specifically, get in touch with your e-learning and disability services departments. Um, if you bump into them in the hall, maybe ask them what their most common, if you, if you have a Jamie at your school, what's the most common accommodation request? What are some of the ways that we're working on, um, on working on providing for those students? Um, if you've gotten online, like I mentioned, to your e-learning department's website, just see what tools they have out there. Try exploring them and, and think about ways that you might be able to use those in a universal design type of setting. So that's your homework. <laughs> um, I would also encourage you to explore the National Center for Universal Design for Learning. This is one of those resources that's listed in the back of your packet. This website is awesome. They have so much good information. It's people like us who are working in this field as instructors and uh, instructors and designers, as well as experts on the learning theory and how it all works together. Um, highly recommend. Um, so if it fits into your uh, time frame, <laughs> choose one of the two, explore, just think about it. Take this away as something to noodle on while you're driving home. Um, and then further on, if you have the opportunity to start with that one thing, maybe it's, um, maybe you're really ambitious and you have a sabbatical coming up and you want to take one whole term that's worth of courses and really dig into your curriculum. <coughs> That would be super cool. However, maybe you're not on sabbatical like most of us, and maybe you just have one class, or maybe just one activity in class, or maybe just one piece of material that is in your course structure. Just start looking at that through that critical lens and seeing where you might be able to apply the changes, and when you have the opportunity to do so, hopefully you feel 
a little bit more confident in your ability to do so. Um, we would love to talk to you more about this if you have questions. I think we have some about five minutes for questions, but our contact information is here. Um, yeah, we would be thrilled to talk to you more about this. So thank you for coming. And if you have questions, we've got time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The resources? I think they're in the packet. Um, you mean like the academic technology list? Is that um, the, you mentioned the kind of the university, mm -hmm. Center of Universal Design. Mm -hmm. You said it was on like a resource list in the packet. I thought oh. there was a resource list in the packet. I don't know if it's on there. Or is it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing that will happen is that uh, it is not after right. the conference, the video will be available, but also there will be a link sent out with all the presentations. Yeah. Oh, marvelous. So apologies, I misspoke about the resource list. But I think this is just like, I mean, if you Google it, it's just like the first thing that comes up, and they will tell you everywhere to go. I really wish that I could link you to our own website, but it's behind an intranet, which makes it so hard to share. And then Caltrans, is that, do they host it on like their own video platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you download it with the um, caption file? So Kaltura is the, the media host, right. um, so it's like a private YouTube. Um, okay. So Kaltura is not actually doing the captioning. We have another caption service. Ours is through automatic caption sync. Other ones that do this are like Rev, R-E-B. Um, so they do closed captions. So that's just what they do. But what they do is they integrate with Kaltura. So when we say we have our video on their server and we say it's kind of, we have to check boxes and things, but anyway, it says whooshes this video over to Caption Sync and then they plug the captions back okay. in and I it disappears. I, I thought that Kaltura was doing the captioning as part of the, as part of the, is it the automated captions? It automates the, the linking of captions to the video. Oh, okay. Yeah. So instructors don't have to go in and download the video and figure out how to get their caption files to run with the video. It just appears in the video in the course. Um, but Kaltura and Panopto, and I, I, I'm sorry, I can't for the life of me remember what the one that works with Canvas specifically is, but it, they talk to each other. So if you upload something and you let the e-learning department know, then we can just, from your perspective, captions magically appear in your video content two or three days later, which right. is a super turnaround. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh? <laughs> That's not the reality. If somebody on the other end is captioning it. It's not like a. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's it's okay. not like a. Um, okay. It's not a text to speech tool itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you think about the one that works with Canvas? Maybe that's the one. I, they, I thought they had an integrated tool. Mm -hmm. And okay. that one does offer um, the automatic captions remain important, but also mm -hmm. can be connected to you know. Company, the exactly. media, whichever to, to create a session. Is that with their base package or is that an add on? Or do you know? Uh, uh, with their base package. Base. It's up to you where you, you can get to what service, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Cal, the, the product Kaltura that we use at our school, we're very, very lucky that we belong to a consortium mm -hmm. of community colleges and that because of that, we get consortium licensing for the product. So, ergo, it, it becomes very, very cost effective for our schools. Yes. All 17 community colleges in Oregon have Kaltura, um, and we're because of that licensing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it just occurred to me, I literally just remember. So, Kaltura is a whole suite of tools. Wow. Right. Yeah, so I actually think that they do have a product that does automatic transcription. We don't particularly have that. I mean, we okay. don't. But I think there is actually a product that's part of their suite. Pretty sure that they have one that does that. It's newer, but I'm fairly confident that they do. I, I use that, and that does have occurred because it's been compared to the parallel of YouTube, mm -hmm. where YouTube has a mm -hmm. uh, speech to text. Yeah, they're automated generated ones. Which, FYI, if that's your first time going out, double check your work because <laughs> it'll, it'll have errors if you haven't seen oh, yes. <laughs> anyway, it. Oh, yes. 90% awesome, free, great service, but there's sometimes errors. Yeah, if you're using, if you're teaching in a technical field specifically, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Go just go double check. And we always do tell, we always try to strive to tell our faculty that, you know, uh, if you do your video this afternoon, don't expect to get it by 8 o'clock that night. You know, we do try to set them with realistic expectations if they want to get a reasonable amount of time. Because it does take us time to get that back. Not that much time, though, surprisingly. Is it quick? Well, thank you for thank attending. You. Yes. Wait, they get that on page. Yeah. Are we doing this? Hi. Hi. I think I recognize you up there. I was just asking him, but I was looking for like. I think I do, and then I, was, I gotta go to the session. So, because I saw you earlier, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. She's like, I came to the session. Oh, yeah. oh, the handouts? Yes, oh, yes. Good. Thank you. This is cool slide. Yeah, it's amazing. That was the one we session yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. So we're a heart attack and Thank you for addressing this to me. You know, if you want to do it, you are still working on it. this opportunity to share. Um, uh, anytime she sees like departments that are working well together, she's like, yes. <laughs> I think she does great. Oh my God, they hate. <laughs> I, and I have to do a little bit. And do it's nice to see you. Yes, and I, and this is the first time I've come to this conference, and it's just in our backyard. Oh, thanks. That's the first time. You're really um, a happy person. So, well, my colleague, Yesko, she's uh, a... <laughs> I know. Did he sound like that? Yes. We usually, um, it's then, easier to... Oh, this yeah. is a conference that we do. She's still so, like too. her baby. So, oh, cool. I think I you sounded pretty you casual, so that's good. We didn't sound like that. Right, right, right. Yeah. 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 And, and then Yesko. Hi, I'm Anna. Nice to meet you. Yes, good. So, yeah. Yeah. Super excited. Oh, good. Let's go. Yeah. Which I feel like, man, this is such a big... Topic. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so oh, good. I was hoping because I know what you want. Great. Thank you for the handout. Amazing. Okay. It's going to be so so cheap, basically. So the clicker is that. I think it might come with the next year. Oh my God! It works pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was great. I'm glad our poll is actually failed. Oh, that's good. Which school? Oh, yeah. University of Washington, Bath. Exactly oh, what we just said. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay. Oops. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you doing any more? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because like, like, the airport is like I made a tape. Vehicle, but you can just walk. Is that close? Oh, yeah. you do have that good sign. Yeah, let's close this down. It's a business beginning. Is this? Why did you not get voiceover for baby movies? <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> Guys, is this your USB? <laughs> that is for the uh, remote. Okay, perfect. It just said, do you want to save the file? And I'm like, uh-oh, oh, where is it? <laughs> I said, no, so I'll just close it. I'm like, oh, there's a USB somewhere. Okay. Thank you. Do you mind if I sign myself out? No, I was glad because we're about to sign in. Okay. It has to save. I'm like, oh, they were in the Okay, they were in the drive. Sometimes it's a blur, right, when you're presenting? Oh, yeah, I know. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Learning for us. Yeah. Okay. I think you're all set. Uh, I was Ooh, and you brought the whole crap. Yeah. Which is good. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> no. Amy, you want to push with the ratio first? Because, like,
Yeah. It's fine. There she's fine. Oh, you already opened. Oh, we're we're going to be more specific. Okay, we're going to be more specific. Let me see what you got going on. There's two ways to do this. It could be nice if we could tell you know, this could do that better. I know, that thing is like, the thing is, ours is mostly white. I don't know what's. And so, and then I was presenting at Northwest Mill in the spring, and I showed all this, and then 14 got from for my team. And then this was one of the best practices, and I was saying, white cat, and I was saying, headers, and it's good to have running something like the end headlights. And I'm going, oh my gosh. Then half of the time, so going over the basic best practices, uh -huh. right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. they're going, mm -hmm. well, this information is hard. It's awesome. You don't know how much yeah. people know and don't so, know. So, so we really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. that's great.